I'm here with uh, Dr. Gary Habermas, uh, one of the leading scholars, Christian scholars in the nation, and definitely the expert on the resurrection of Jesus. Gary has written over 40 books, 43 books to be more precise. Um, and uh, Dr. Habermas is not only a, a wonderful scholar, but he's a wonderful friend, mm -hmm. and I love his heart. He's a, he's oh. a, he's a wonderful man. Um, one of the things that, uh, oh, one of the claim of fame, uh, Gary, that I love about your story is that you debated uh, the um, late um, uh, Anthony Flew, Dr. Flew, many times. You mm -hmm. became friends with him. Mm -hmm. You cannot not become friends with uh, Dr. Habermas. Even if he crushes you in a debate, you cannot not become friends with him. Oh, so I, if I crush him, they love me? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but he's such a, such a wonderful friend. And uh, you became friends with Dr. Flew, and before he uh, passed away, he uh, became a believer. He, he became did. a theist. Yeah. And so that was really a wonderful uh, thing. If you don't know Dr. Anthony Flew, he was one of the leading and, atheists. And he knew the plan of salvation. So what I tell people is, I don't know where he was the last two months of his life when he was alone. Maybe he, maybe acted, maybe didn't. I don't know. But as far as I know, he was he was a theist, but not a Christian. Yeah, right? and he wrote a book called uh, "Why I Am a Theist" or something like that. Yeah. Uh, why there is a God? Why there is a God? Why or there, or yeah. no, there is a God. There is a God. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, wonderful claim of fame. And, uh, you know the subtitle of that book? How the Most Notorious Atheist Changed His Mind, I think is the subtitle. So that really is applicable. applicable. And I thought it was funny on the side note how uh, leading atheist uh, said that he was old and he was losing his mind. And right, happened. except this change happened a long time before he, it happened at least six to seven years before he died. Oh, so. okay, wonderful. Well, uh, Gary, thank you for this interview. Um, one of the things I want to talk to you about is uh, the minimal facts approach. Right. Um, because you, that was your dissertation, and uh, I find it to be fascinating. Even people like Jordan Peterson found it interesting. He put it uh, on his website. And uh, um, what is the minimal facts approach, and why is it important? In uh, just a moment, the minimal facts argument is, and the number of facts you use can change, it's variable, but the idea is even if you use the facts which specialist New Testament scholars and others in like fields, so we could say New Testament, theology, classics, history, philosophy, guys who are in relevant fields who have studied the data and who have terminal degrees. Mm -hmm. The reason I say all that is there are so many guys who think Jesus didn't exist, they're really young, between 15 and 25 often, don't have degrees, and they call themselves scholars, and I'm just trying to tell people they're going to be screaming, going, you didn't hear me and my buddies, because they literally write to me and say this, you didn't hear me and my buddies, we would skew all your stats up. Well, I'm not counting your stats because you don't know the field. You know, I don't tell them that, but, but so if you only use the guys who are have terminal, I don't care if it's Richard Carey. Richard Carey is fine. Bob Price is fine. Bart Ehrman's fine. I'd rather use those guys because then they mean more to people and they allow it. And, and Bart Ehrman concedes the minimal facts all over the place. And so I'd rather use them. So I don't care how liberal, skeptical, agnostic, or atheist they are. Bart's an atheist. Um, the idea is if you use only the historical facts, which the vast majority, I'm thinking like over 90%, the vast majority of critical scholars will allow, there's enough of a basis there to argue that the resurrection is the best explanation for the data we have. That's the minimal facts argument. Use the minimal data that everybody will give you and you can still get a resurrection. So again, so you're using data that's not necessarily Christian. It's huh, definitely not. Definitely not Christian and you can come up with a good argument and good uh, evidence for By the way, I should clarify that. It is Christian, but it's not Christian in the sense that it's shared by unbelieving scholars. It's right. shared across the board. Cr across the board. So what are some of those uh, facts? Well, I frequently, I've, I've used as few as three and as many as eight. You go, well, why do you change your number? I don't know. I mean, it really depends on what mood I'm in, if you want to be funny. Um, depends on what audience I'm with. Well, why do the facts change over the years? I don't know, it just hits me that one of them gets more early, is one that was periphery, a little more periphery years ago, but now it's front and center because critics say that this message is in the 
first one to two years. So my list changes the n number. Right now I use six. And the six I use, Jesus died by crucifixion. Afterwards, his disciples, and I word this very carefully, his disciples had experiences that they believed were appearances of the risen Jesus. Bart Ehrman concedes that. The message was taught very early, Bart Ehrman, to keep using him. Bart Ehrman says we have many texts in the New Testament, creedal texts and Acts sermon summaries that give this information, the first two points, and they date the texts date from one to two years after the cross. James Dunn said the creed in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 could have, been, could have happened the same year Jesus was crucified. So early is my third one, very early. Four, their lives were transformed to, by this message to the point where they were willing to die. Now someone stops me and goes, everyone dies for what they believe. Muslims die for what they believe. Jews die for what they believe. Christians die for what I'll bet you atheist communists die during the Russian Revolution, whatever. Right. China, oh, for sure. That happens. People die for what they believe, and obviously the majority are wrong because there's a whole bunch of views. You go, well, then why are the disciples different? Because all these other beliefs, Christians included, the knife cuts both ways, all these other groups die for a belief that they have that they've learned from someone else. The communist who dies for a utopian society believed Karl Marx, Lenin, Stalin, they, okay, so they know, they believe their stuff. Uh, Muslims believe their sources. Hindus believe their sources. Everybody believes their own sources. They're dying for their beliefs. The you go, so did the disciples. That's true. But the disciples had something no one else had. They not only died for their beliefs, they died for what they saw. And none of these other people died for what they saw because they're way too far removed from even the later ones, Marx, Scott, uh, Stalin, Lenin. It's still way too far to say they saw it. And the guys who have religions, Hindu, Muslim, whatever, it's way earlier. They, they die because they think Ra Radhakrishnan was speaking the truth. They die because they think Muhammad spoke the truth. They die because Moses spoke the truth, because Jesus spoke the truth. They died for truth. The disciples died for truth and what they saw. So they died, and I say it this way, they were willing to die. That's what I usually say. Not We can't prove they all died as mm -hmm. martyrs. But they were willing to die for the resurrection. Oh, that's way too specific. No, it's not. Watch this. They died for Christ They were willing to die for Christianity. Is that true? Okay. Well, the key to Christianity is the gospel. Is that true? They died. For they were willing to die for the gospel. Okay. Paul said, if there's no resurrection, there's no Christianity, and everybody believes that. So they were willing to die for the resurrection. Many did. I can't prove they all did, but they were all willing to die, and they were the ones who saw Jesus. You go well. Yeah, but we don't have their testimony. You're probably thinking they wrote the Gospels. I'm not assuming that at all. My best argument is Paul sets the argument out in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and following, but then he went to Jerusalem in Galatians 1 and again in Galatians 2. They would like to excise those verses. Mm. Um, so he goes to Jerusalem and interviews the big four, James, Peter, John, Paul. Barnabas is there, Titus is there, but nobody's bigger than these four. Nobody's bigger than these four. And Paul said, I checked out the gospel with them, and in English, because he wrote in Greek, of course, they added nothing to me. They added nothing to me. And then a few verses later, they give Paul and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. They blessed them. You don't bless heretics. So that tells me, where did Paul get the testimonies of Peter, James, the brother of Jesus, and John. They told him. He interviewed him. Right. So that is why early is important. That's why them willing to die for it's important. Then my last two are the two skeptics, James, the brother of Jesus, and Paul. You go, well, you already mentioned them. No, I already mentioned that they thought they saw the risen Jesus. What I want to talk about in the last two points is that they were converted from being an, an unbelieving family member, what's a special kind of skeptic, and a persecutor who either killed or watched other people kill men, women, children, or imprisoned them uh, who were Christians. So they're special kinds of skeptics, and they came on board because they also had, I'm careful of my language again, they also had ex experiences that they thought were appearances of the risen Jesus. Interesting. So 
what you're saying is that they were not inclined to believe in the message. They're actually Paul who was persecuting the church. And so it's they not like came, he wanted to believe it. They came from across the street. They came from, you know, they didn't come because, you know, critics say, well, maybe Paul had an epileptic seizure on the way to Damascus. That's funny because, number one, there's no evidence for that. So why do you yell at me for having no evidence? Then you're free to make theories that are totally groundless. Mm. You know, but here's another problem with that view. Paul had a seizure. Well, if you're going to use the acts of Paul never says, I saw this, that's Acts, mm -hmm. where there's kind of like a, the light and all that. Paul just said, I saw Jesus. And the language is bodily, by the way, 1 Corinthians 9, 1 Corinthians 15. But if you go, oh no, but those Acts accounts, that's kind of amorphous. He probably had some, he may be epileptic seizure. Really? Well, I never saw a guy had an epileptic seizure and everybody around him also fell to the ground. Right. Uh, you know, so number one, you don't have any evidence for it. Number two, it doesn't fit the facts. What else you got for me? Interesting. You know, so I mean, I'm talking fast, but I'm used to this. I, I've gone through this stuff for 40 years. So I know you have. But it's in interesting, uh, Gary, how, how you have 1 Corinthians 15, which is very early. It sounds maybe in the mind of, uh, of 21st century people that one to two years is <laughs> far out because of social media. Everybody but, admits it. Right. And, uh, but what I'm saying is that for an event of antiquity, one to two years is really, I mean, really early compared to... And if Jimmy Dunn is right, maybe the same year. Maybe the same year. It's and amazing. what's interesting is in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, uh, he goes through the names of people who've seen uh, the disciples, who've seen the risen Jesus, and he goes saying that there are over 500 uh, people There's who have three seen groups. There's three groups in just that little one. There's the 12, a group called all the apostles, and the 500. Uh, and by, you know, it, it's, it's just amazing material because people try to think of quickie ways to get away from it, mm -hmm. and they really can't because the data are right there, and uh, you got to do something with it. You got something with it, and you, all these 500 people, Paul says, most of them are alive. So, you know, it's not like two generations later, you know, it's claiming something. Uh, my grandfather saw. No, it's saying, hey, I saw it. And it's not like they had anything to gain from saying that, Gary. Well, yeah, what one critic said, Paul was hoping to step up the social ladder from becoming a Christian. Uh, excuse me. He was already up the social ladder as one of the leaders of the Pharisees. Christians were the lowest of the low. He wasn't moving up the social no. ladder. And the way so. his life ended, it's not exactly, you know. Yeah. Um, now, by the way, I did these six facts with one of the top New Testament skeptics of the world. Anybody who reads the field would know who this guy is. And he and I dialogued on it live for two hours. And um, the moderator said, he asked me, what are you going to use? I gave six facts. He turns to the other guy. Do you have any problem with his facts? The guy's an agnostic. He says, do you have any problem with these? The guy goes, no. He said, I don't have any problem with these six because Gary's six facts are the strongest, strongest facts in the New Testament. The guy goes, cool. By the end of the two hours, the moderator said to the guy, can I ask you a personal question? Sure. Why aren't you a believer? And the guy said, the agnostic said, I'm not into belief. I'm into New Testament as a discipline. I'm not into belief. And as someone who heard it said to me, what he was saying was, four words, I don't want to. That's what he was saying. I don't want to. But he didn't say, I can refute it. Right. He said, I don't want to. I don't want to. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, it makes me think of uh, Simon Greenleaf, yeah. how we thought of, uh, of uh, he was an atheist, and one of his students challenged At him. Harvard. At Harvard. And one of the fathers of our modern uh, law you know, system and how to come to a verdict, right? And he, uh, he, when faced with the evidence of the 500 witnesses, and he said, if I, they had gone through a court of law, I mean, it would have taken forever to hear all these witnesses, and you could not judge in the favor of the resurrection. And he became a Christian. And he became a Christian. Yeah. He became a Christian. And uh, so it's, it's, it's very interesting, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to deal with those facts. And uh, um, is there anything else that you would like to add to somebody who's seeking? Uh, Gary, if somebody's seeking right now, listening, what would you encourage them to, to do? And I'd say at? study these in whatever facts you want to. Don't, when I say, see if you can think of refutations. Let's say historical refutations. Don't say, 
Maybe there's these people on Alpha Centuria who can't, okay, I mean, I mean, you know, be realistic. Can you come up with a, a historical refutation? And if, and if you're like this agnostic I just mentioned, um, why don't you want to? Mm -hmm. Is it a volitional thing? Yeah, right now I want to, you know, I'm between 18 and 30 and I want to sow my wild oats and after I settle down with somebody and start having kids, maybe I'll come to faith. You know what I mean? It's like, well, my lifestyle right now isn't conducive to that. If, if that's your reason, well, hey, I can respect that in this sense. Mm -hmm. I can respect it in the sense that if you're saying I'm exercising my free will, that's your right. God gave you your free will. So I understand you exercise your free will. But if you're really interested to see if there's an afterlife and a kingdom, I'd say, look at the facts. Now, the next question is, can you disprove it? If you can't, what are you sitting there for? Right. You know? It's, it's powerful. Uh, if you can disprove you, you, when I first became a, a uh, when I was seeking uh, for the truth, uh, and the, I looked at the evidence for the resurrection, and through your books and some other work, uh, I, it was overwhelming. And then I said, you know what, let me see what critics have to say about alternatives to the resurrection. And I was a little scared. I thought I would you know, find some good arguments against it. And that There's almost none. And that really made me, my, uh, my search for, for, for the truth and, uh, for, and, and believing in the resurrection made it even stronger. The case. Because when I looked at the alternatives, <coughs> they yeah. were quite weak. Could you mention something to that? Yeah, I was just say, I, I wrote an article 20 years ago that said naturalistic theories had had a, 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 a slight increase in the previous two decades. All right, since that time, 2000, there's been a radical drop off. The guys who will pick a theory are generally, if you do a head count, the people who will pick a theory are generally old, they're older scholars who have more guts, who are stepping out there. The younger guys, almost very few of them will step up to the plate and go, yeah, I'll take this, I'll take that. Almost none of them do anymore. The guys who do it are Garrett Ludeman, John Shelby Spong, guys who, Bart Ehrman just recently said in one of our more recent books, I'm not gonna pick a naturalistic theory anymore. Oh, wow. Well, I think the reason they would vociferously deny this, I think the reason is, if they pick a theory, uh, Bart even says it. He goes, I know what they're going to do, because I used to do it. He said I was an evangelical. If you pick a theory, they're going to go after you. In fact, he said they're going to be something like, they're going to be licking their chops like a hungry dog. They want you to pick a theory because they're going after you. So what do the critics not do? Pick a theory. And they just go do amorphous things like this. Ah, it's a bunch of bull. You know, eyewitnesses didn't write those Gospels. Ah, sorry, I didn't use the, I didn't use the Gospels. What else you got for me? Well, I don't know, you, you conservative Bible thumpers, you, th they'll say things that are like incendiary, sometimes not, mm -hmm. but they'll say things that sound like they're given an answer, but they're not given a response to the resurrection. A person in the crowd could say, whoa, he's got a basket full of doubts there. Not one of them, very possibly, not one of them was on the resurrection. Okay. Like I said, well, the Old Testament had, you know, commands genocide, let's just say. Well, I think we can deal with that. We've got some people here who deal with it. But I would say, what's your problem? Let's just say for the sake of the argument, yes, the Old Testament teaches genocide. Just, just if that shuts you up, fine. Sure. Now, can we talk about the resurrection? What about genocide? Hey, I'll handle that. Let, let's, mm -hmm. do, let's you and I have lunch next week. Let's do it. But right now, let, don't, don't get me off the subject. I want you to respond to the deity, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Well, I don't think... Keep going. Well, I think you, you early earthers are nuts. Nobody believes that in science. Yeah, thank you for that. Now, can you respond to the resurrection? You have to keep them on task right. and coming back. So Michael Cohen and I frequently go, and? Well, I got a problem with that. And? I don't. You do? Fine. You do. And? What else is on your mind? Aren't you going to answer me? I want to talk about the resurrection. Right, because Paul says, that, you know, without the resurrection, really, our faith is in vain. It's all 
stands on the on the resurrection yeah. of Jesus because it's that's the difference between Christianity and any other faith yeah. religion there's ideology nothing like there's nothing like it if you claim to be God and you tell me I'll die and then in three days I'll see you uh, and, I'll then like, you and then you, you do it and then you do it I'll, I'll you laugh at it. you I'll laugh at you Gary but if you do it I'll take you seriously now two two uh, two of the, of the alternatives and then in will uh, before we end the the, the interview Two of the alternatives. One is the group hallucination that you know that uh, everybody hallucinated and so Jesus risen. And number two is the swoon theory. And could you could you uh, mention something something to effect? Yeah, the, there's a lot of problems with hallucination. All right, you go well. You just say that. Okay, I'll put my money where my mouth is. I I've several months ago finished a chapter on hallucinations for my magnum opus. I've got like 25 refutations of hallucinations. So let's just say, take my word for it, it's coming out. And I already have it, I have another article in print already with 19 refutations. Okay. So I'm in print, there's many, many, in fact I have another one with a bunch of, I just remembered it, another one with about 50 pages on it. All right, there's a lot of refutations. But I think one is enough. One friend of mine is a clinical psychologist, a co-author, another friend who is a medical doctor and a co-author. Both of them did exhaustive lit reviews, one in clinical psychology, one in medicine. They said going back approximately 25 years, there's not a single documented, anybody can talk, oh I was in a group and we saw, chances are when they do that, when they're in a group and they see something, it's not an hallucination, it's an illusion. We saw a buzzard, no it really was a buzzard, we thought it was a UFO. I mean, that, that's not an hallucination. That's a, you saw a buzzard, that something was there. That's an illusion. Mm -hmm. Get your categories right. An hallucination is much more radical. Mm -hmm. You see something when there's nothing. And the problem is, these two, the clinical psychologist, medical doctor, found no, uh, no documented cases, I think it was for 25 years back, none. And here's your problem. You're going to take, you're going to say, well, it still could happen. Okay, cool. It still could happen. Not on record. See, and you're always the one that begs me to be scientific. Yeah. I got the science. You're running from it. But whatever, you think you're going to use it once. And the early creed, there's three creed. There's three. And then the Jesus Seminar, of all people, and Helmut Kirster, student of uh, Rudolf Boltman and a skeptic, they both say, Jesus Seminar and Kirster both go, ah, oh, there's another one here. Besides the three, the women. Don't forget the women. That's four group appearances. Mm -hmm. All right, so there's like none in the annals of science and, and, and uh, psychology and medicine, and you're going to just blow off four like it could have just happened? And there's not one? Right. You need four? And by the way, if the Gospels turn out to be reliable, you're going to have a bunch more group of, group appearances. So hallucination doesn't stand a chance. Could Jesus have survived the uh, crucifixion? Okay. Let, I'll do, see, whenever I do minimal facts, you know, I always make this move, let's just say you're right. I think you're easily wrong. Let's say you're right. Here's the big problem. The biggest refutation of swoon is not could we have taken a pulse? What would an EEG show? What would EKG show? That's not the biggest objection. If he dies, what, you're the skeptic. What day do you want to say? What, what, I don't mean what date, but what day of the week did he die on? Friday. Friday. What day was he seen for the first time? Sunday. So he, let's say he's a mere man, really bad shape, but didn't die. What shape is he going to be in in a day and a half by the clock? A day and a half from Friday late afternoon to Sunday real early morning. What shape is he going to be in? Not good. Not good. Nails? People could say, and people do say this, maybe it was tied. Let me tell you something. There's almost no tied, there is one or two, but there are almost no tied references in the crucifixion data. The nail, not only are the nail data far more common, Jews thought it was good luck to hang on to the nails. Hmm. Nails are much more prominent. So if the guy who comes out on Sunday morning was nailed, and I could keep giving you details forever. One guy, one skeptic who took this view 200 years ago said, well, let's just exempt the nails and the feet. You know why? He wanted them to be able to walk okay, but you're just exempting things that help your theory. You don't have data. Why do I put nails in the hands and tie the feet? I mean, so, so what shape is he in a day and a half later? Nails in his, we can forget the hands for now, but 
wrists actually, but so he's nailed to the feet. He may or may not have been stabbed to the side, depending on where you are on that day. On that, he's asphyxiating. If he didn't die, he was pretty darn close. He was whipped almost to death, and he's going to get up and walk to wherever the disciples are in the city. Let's say it's a quarter of a mile away. We'll be kind. It might have been a lot further. He walks a quarter of a mile. I'm not a hunter, but people who track deer could track Jesus. They track a deer in the woods from blood. They could track Jesus on flat land, on dirt, from the tomb to the disciples. He's bleeding. He's pale. They open the door, and he can barely walk, and they go, raise from the dead. It's a total joke. This is what they would say. I praise God that he spared you. I can see that. I praised God that he spared you. Here's Peter. Adam, a pan of wa hot water and a rag. Mary, go get the physician down the street. And Peter's going to start giving directions. Let's nurse him back to health. Don't get me wrong. It's an answer to prayer. God, God kept him alive. Mm -hmm. What he didn't do was raise him. So no matter what you think about the cross, this is called Strauss's critique, because the guy who came up with this was more or less the most liberal, German liberal in the 19th century. He right. died a disillusioned man who rejected God and afterlife, the two big things for the liberals. Mm -hmm. He died without those. He said this wound theory is a total joke because the Jesus who was raised could not have convinced anybody, the guy who walked out of the tomb, not raised, right. couldn't have convinced anybody who was raised. Alive, yes. Raised, no. So the swoon theory is self-refuting. Okay. So not only to 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 for them to believe in him, but to sacrifice their whole lives for him, to, to make him Lord. And don't forget, they're the ones who watched it. Yeah. So I think, we can, I think we can be fairly secure. If they died for the resurrection appearances, he didn't come in, as we would say in the 60s, mm -hmm. he didn't come in looking like death warmed over. Right. That's not what he looked like. And he didn't look like we better bury him right now. And the skeptics of the time, those who crucified him, would have been quick at catching him. Well, do you know what? There's a verse early in Acts that says a bunch of priests came to the faith. No explanation. Why did they come to the faith? Did they know some insider things? Did they hear somebody say, man, we should have done a better job shutting this guy up, blah, 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 blah. Did they hear some stuff? Right. Did they hear his testimony before the Sanhedrin where he claimed to be, he claimed to be divine? Mm -hmm. Four times he claimed to be deity, Mark 14, 61, 64. I'm telling you what, this case is, it, the case for the gospel, deity, death, resurrection, is tight. Mm -hmm. Very tight. It's beautiful. Based on, the, on their data. On their data. That's the beauty, and I will, will end it there. That's the beauty of a minimal facts approach, and that's why I, I love it so much. I encourage you to look into it because it really takes a look objectively at the information. Forget about just having a uh, you know, presupposition from, from a Christian perspective, but looking at it from an objective uh, perspective of all scholars, believing and unbelieving scholars, yeah. and looking at, at the alternatives like we just did. Yeah. And uh, because it is uh, crucial to look at that, at that evidence and to come to a decision for Christ. M many of them will say, objective? It's not objective. Where does he teach? stinking liberty and where does he get his degrees blah, blah, blah. he's been a christian for he's been a pastor that's not objective i go time out it's not my data get it from john shelby spong get it from garrett ludeman get it from and they go well ludeman admits all your facts but he thinks it's a hallucination let's talk hallucination no matter where you have it but i i i resent it when they they want to pass it off as right. it's some christian it's not objective no i got it from bart i got it from ludeman i got it from spong i got it from don crossett i got it from marcus borg i got it from dale allison the most respected skeptical scholars so and i respect people who are willing to openly debate those things which you have done more than once enough to i'm tired i'm tired of hearing their objections and finding out their objections are either emotional or volitional, not factual. Exactly. They hide behind factual, and then they go, what if it's Alpha Centauri? It's like, yeah, you're being real factual. Thank you, Gary. Thank you very much for your friendship, for your scholarship. I encourage you to look at the facts objectively, remove the emotions from it, because you may have some emotional reasons not to believe. Just look at it uh, from uh, a evidential and, uh, and that the, uh, you know, at the, uh, 
facts and the evidence behind it and make a decision for Christ because it's the most important decision that I believe you can ever make. Yeah, it's only for eternity. It's only for eternity. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Well, How long was the interview? Yeah, 10, ten, ten hours. hours. <laughs> Dinner is well, nah, it's my pleasure. You're my buddy. You're my favorite. So, <laughs> favorite. My wife won't even say that. You guys remember that? Because I don't live with you. That's why you. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're my favorite. <laughs> right? So. Uh,